We are very glad to have you here this evening and very glad to have this uh, forum here. For those of you who aren't familiar with our organization, we are an 88-year-old organization come out of the Settlement House Movement. We are the historic gathering place of the African-American community in St. Paul. Our roots go back to the other side of the highway with 553 Aurora, where you'll see some of our magnificent golden agers in the room and maybe a few of our retired men who were at that original location. But when the highway came through, this building was constructed in partnership with the city in order to preserve some of the heritage, some of the culture, and some of the programming that exist. So we opened here in 1972, so 45 years in this location. And we are an organization that focuses in on basic human services for families in the community. We're open to everyone, even though we have an African-American identity. So those are our roots. That is the culture of the organization. But anybody who walks through our doors gets served. So we're very pleased to have you all here. This is going to be an exciting night. Glad all of the candidates that showed up could be here. And I'm going to turn it over to Amy Mino from the League of Women Voters of St. Paul. Thank you, Jonathan. We're very pleased to be here tonight at the Hallie Q. Brown Center and the center of this community here in St. Paul, very important community. Um, I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of St. Paul, and uh, we believe in the success of our state depends on the values and the knowledge and commitment of our elected officials. Thus, it is essential for the public to better understand the views, opinions, and commitments of the people running for elected office. It is the understanding that better equips voters with information to make informed voting decisions, and we appreciate the candidates and the audience members for taking the time to be here tonight. So thank you very much. Your moderator tonight is Sasha Cotton, Vice Chair of the African American Leadership Council. The council strives to act on issues affecting the African American community, and she is also currently the, the Youth Violence Prevention Coordinator for the City of Minneapolis and serves as project manager for the Group Violence Intervention Strategy. In these roles, she acts as a liaison between the city and the community as it relates to youth and community violence and helps improve communication between city officials, community organizations, and all citizens concerned with public safety. Uh, her extensive background includes providing technical assistance, training, and implementation of community engagement strategies related to violence prevention in diverse communities. Um, and she has a lot of work experience uh, prior to this position, including the National Resource Center Coordinator at the Institute on Domestic Violence in the African American community, as well as serving as the Prevention Program Manager for the Minnesota Coalition of Battered Women. Ms. Cotton also worked in various direct service positions in the criminal justice system, and she is also a commissioner with the St. Paul's with St. Paul's C Police Civilian Internal, Internal Affairs Review Commission. So please join me in welcoming Ms. Cotton. Well, thank you for that robust introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone. Um, we're very pleased to see so many faces in the audience. And without ado, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, as said before, I'm Sasha Cotton, the moderator for this evening. I feel like this is really loud. Um, <laughs> so before we begin, I'd like to let you all know that you have cards on your chairs. I think most of you know that. Um, if you have a question, um, please write it out on the card and then hold it up and one of our ushers or volunteers will come and bring it up here. We'll do our best to get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. Um, and then also representatives from Fair Vote Minnesota have been here out in the atrium um, talking about ranked choice voting. If you'd like to register to vote, please stop by the league's table and they will help you take care of that. Um, this forum is for candidates running for office of mayor in the city of St. Paul. I think all of you know that's why you're here. And tonight we have, and I know that we're a little out of order, we have Sharon Anderson on this end. And then we have, um, sorry, <laughs> I can't see your name down there. Barnabas. Barnabas, thank you. We have Barnabas uh, Yushua. I want to make sure I'm getting names right. We have Melvin Carter, Taryn Cruz, Elizabeth Dickinson, Tom Goldenstein, Pat Goldstein, 
Pat Harris, Chris Holbrook, Tim Holden, City Council Representative Dai Tao will be joining us. He's unfortunately delayed because he's at council um, and they're in a hearing. And that is the total amount of our candidates for tonight. I do have some rules that I need to delineate before we can get started with questions. So each candidate will give a two minute introductory statement. The candidates will have one minute to answer each of their questions. We would generally allow for a 30 second rebuttal, but we're gonna minimize that so that we can get as many questions answered as possible tonight. A timer will signal them when they have reached 15 seconds remaining to when their time is up. We will accept written questions, as I mentioned before, throughout the forum. Questions submitted by the audience must not be personal in nature and must be on topics relevant for state office. All questions must be addressed to all candidates. Once you have a question written, please pass it or hold it up and we will make sure that one of our ushers comes by to grab it. Questions that are of personal nature, embarrassing, hostile, or unclear in intent will not be asked. Uh, similar questions may be consolidated and questions may be edited for clarity or brevity. I will do my best to keep all of the questions um, as clear and concise as possible. Um, campaign literature, buttons, signs, clothing, or any other campaign related items are not allowed in the room, but information on candidates is out in the hallway for those who brought it. Please remain as quiet as possible so that everyone may hear. Please hold your applause until the forum has ended so that candidates will have as much time as possible to answer your questions. And please place your cell phones on silent or um, vibrate. Members of the media will be recording for their for this forum for their own use um, and videoing as well for the St. Paul Neighborhood Network for viewing by the public. Other video or audio taping or photography during this forum is not permitted. And with that, we will start the opening statements. We will go in alphabetical order. So Ms. Anderson, if you would like to start, please. You have two minutes. May I stand and salute you, Semper Fi, always faithful to God, country, and family. I'm the widow of a Silver Star Marine, Purple Heart, and I thank you all for coming. Can you hear me? All right. So today I got a newsletter out. Let's save the Super Bowl. I'm sure you're all aware of what's going on with the Super Bowl. But I don't want to be negative or all candidates got the letter. Miss Anderson, can I interrupt you and ask you to use a mic for the recording, please? Thank you. I'm always doing something wrong. Not wrong. We just want to make sure as many voices get to hear you as possible. All right. So I guess we don't have to turn it on. Okay. Thank you to Jonathan Palmer, who was the uh, executive director. And they said it turns on over there. Okay. Hi to all persons, media hosts. Disclaimer, if my left eye is flirting with you, you know, <laughs> I'm a widow. It's because I'm blind in my left eye with medical malpractice. Do you remember the child's prayer, now I lay me down to sleep? Well, my new saying now is, if I die tomorrow, I'm going to live today. They can't hear me? Just a little closer. Oh, boy, I thought I'd, I thought I'd talk loud enough. OK, anyhow, you can laugh with me as my deceased husband called me his old lady. You know, years ago, that was a, a friendly term. So. <laughs> Now, don't you dare just call me old timer, okay? Now that I am a senior political rebel, rogue if you want to call it, I am a Trump supporter. He reminds me of my dad. However, sex, religion, politics are the issue. Politics have become boring, money-making racket. I don't take any money, I don't spend any money except for the $500 fee, which I took out of my social security 1,200 and something. I got 30 seconds. I get $16 food stamps and they even took a dollar away from me. I'm impoverished. Religion is the Sharia law. Nukes of North Korea, terrorists. I guess I gotta stop, but sex. I think Trump is the sexiest man alive by holding hands with his wife. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll go to Mr. Carter. Good evening. Good evening, thank you so much for being here. This is exciting for me. Uh, I'm Melvin Carter, I'm a fourth generation St. Paul resident, I'm a lifelong DFLer, and I'm running in a community that our family has been in uh, for a hundred years. My great grandparents came here uh, from Paris, Texas. 
which was at the time known worldwide as one of the most hostile, viciously racist towns uh, in the world. They came here because they heard there were some jobs here, there was some opportunity here, and there was some fairness here that they could tap into. My grandparents, uh, many of you knew my grandparents, uh, my grandmother who fought hard to make sure that there was a swimming pool at Oxford Playground for the African American children in the neighborhood. My grandfather who spent 28 years in our public schools as a custodian at Humboldt High School. And my parents who have served this community both as a police officer and a teacher. And I'm running in a community that raised me. I grew up in our public schools, our rec centers. I always say our rec centers, but I should say this rec center. I used to come take the school bus here after school every single day uh, for after school programs and run and track and we'd, we'd roller skate in the gym on Fridays for 50 cents. So I grew up surrounded by adults, some of you are in this room, who were determined to see us succeed whether we liked it or not. And that should be our vision for everyone. I'm also a parent in our public schools, and I'm raising my children in a community where a child born in St. Paul, their life outcomes for many of them can be predicted more accurately based on their race, their zip code, and their parents' educational attainment than based on how hard they work and how smart they are. That is not something I'm prepared to live with. We are here to build a city that works well for all of us, to eliminate our disparities, to build schools that work well for all of our children, a local economy that starts with raising the minimum wage, that works well for all of our families, and public services from our police to our snow plows that work well in all of our neighborhoods. Thank you very much. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Traron Cruz, and I'm a, a child of Rondo. My uncle, uh, Henry Davis, was the last house standing in the Rondo neighborhood, and they had, the sheriff had to come and pull him out before they bulldozed the house. Um, I didn't grow up with a spoon in my mouth, so I have a quick um, statement I want to read. I didn't grow up with a spoon in my mouth. I was taught work ethic and standing up for justice was instilled in me as a child and as mayor of the city of St. Paul, I will stand up for you the same way. In 1849, Ramsey County was founded as a political entity which was racist. Ramsey County in the city of St. Paul was not designed for the darker people of the planet Earth or so-called people of color. A study conducted in 2008 by the Ramsey County Human Services Department concluded that, uh, concluded that Ramsey County's policies were designed to control the people that society fears, fears the most, in the city of St. Paul too. But um, it wasn't designed for people of color, it was designed for French Norwegians, uh, French Canadians, Norwegians, and Swiss. So when I'm this November, when I'm, when I'm elected, I will make sure that all departments of the city government are designed for all the residents of St. Paul. Thank you. Ms. Dickinson. My name is Elizabeth Dickinson, and I'm running for mayor of St. Paul. Thank you so much for being here tonight. It's a really important contribution to our democracy to participate. I'm the green candidate, which means that I'm committed to social, economic, and environmental justice. 12 years ago, I ran for mayor. I was eliminated in the primary. I was outspent 20 to 1, but I nearly got 20% uh, of the vote. So I'm back here again. My past includes being the community affairs manager at the Minnesota AIDS Project. I also worked for the Association for Non-Smokers. I worked on Becky Lurie's campaign for governor. I worked for Healthy Legacy, trying to get toxic chemicals out of consumer products, including BPA out of baby bottles. And I also worked for the National uh, Parent Teacher Association on higher educational standards here, Georgia, and in Washington State. So there's a wide range of issues and policies that I've worked on over the years. What I'm running for this time, um, one of the things, of course, that you'd expect is that I focus on energy and the environment. I have a plan on my website for how we might get to solar on the schools. And I'd like to see us make a good faith effort to try and get more solar and wind manufacturers and installers to town because that whole industry is growing 12 times faster than any other, and it represents true economic opportunity, particularly for people of color. In addition, I support raising the minimum wage. 
There is, I support the 15 now plan. I believe that we should raise the minimum wage to $15 over the next four to seven years because there is no one thing that I could do as mayor that would do more to impact communities of color and people living in poverty. It's estimated that 68,000 St. Paulites would be lifted out of poverty by that one thing. So I hope some of the other things that I support will come out through the questions. And thank you again for being here. Thank you, Mr. Goldstein. And we would ask that you hold your applause just so we can give the candidates more time. So please hold them till the end of the session. So I'm Tom Goldstein. I want to thank um, Jonathan and everyone for holding this forum. And I want to acknowledge the ground on which I stand. And I, and I want to direct this more to the people that live here as well as the people in the room and those who live here who are not here. Talk about the city. Um, how has this community benefited from the Saints Ballpark? From the Penfield Apartments downtown with the Lunds store in it? With the Palace Theater downtown and entertainment complex? With the Wild Practice Facility? With the soccer stadium? With what's proposed for the Ford plant? Where are the plans to have investments in this community like when Control Data came here in the 1960s and built a plant and hired within the community? There's a plaza going up to honor Rondo and I support those who led to that but I'm sure you would much rather have the jobs and the community back than just have a plaza to commemorate it. Now everybody up here is going to promise you all the things they're going to do for your neighborhood and the question is how are you going to pay for it? Here's how I would pay for it. I would focus on investing and rebuilding our infrastructure. Streets, roads, bridges create jobs in that way. And that we focus on our parks and rec centers and libraries so you're not competing across the city with someone else for funding that if you want to build a soccer stadium, it's available, but if it comes to upgrading your facility, sorry we don't have the money. I would focus on all day pre-K and after school programming so there is a continuum of care for kids that are protected all day long and parents are not scrambling for where their kids are going to be in the morning or where they're going to be in the afternoon and that they're protected and we're using our facilities together. And I would do something about the digital divide which particularly impacts communities like this because Comcast and CenturyLink does not care about this community. They want to go to the wealthiest parts of the city and maximize their revenue there. We need to provide the similarity so that the digital divide does not worsen the opportunity gap. And finally, job creation. We have to create jobs, real jobs. We have to lift wages by not just raising the minimum wage but actually creating the, the technology jobs of tomorrow. So that's my platform. It's in my literature and I thank you for being here tonight. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Thank you so much for being here tonight, everybody. Thank you, Jonathan, and the folks at Halley Q for putting this on with, uh, with the league. This is the stuff that really makes a difference, folks, when people can come out and learn about where everybody stands and how we can make a difference in St. Paul. I'm Pat Harris. I'm a fourth generation resident of St. Paul. My wife, Laura, and I are raising our four kids in this great city. All my life, every day I wake up, I want to make a difference. I spent 12 years in the St. Paul City Council where I was a leader on the budget, on our libraries, where I created St. Paul's Independent Public Library Agency, which resulted in the Rondo Library, the Arlington Library, and renovations to other libraries throughout our system. I was a leader on affordable housing. I was a leader on parks and so many other things for our city. As a nonprofit leader, my wife and I have served on boards, Catholic Charities, Como, Como Zoo, the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, so many other organizations that make a difference every day in St. Paul. For the last 18 years, I've been a private sector public finance professional where I've made a difference on the finances and the efficiencies of cities, counties, and school districts all across the nation. As the founder of Serving Our Troops, I've served 90,000 stakes to the soldiers and the families of the Minnesota National Guard, recognizing the sacrifice that they make so that we could be in rooms like this today. I've made an entire career out of making a difference for St. Paul in our region. And that's why I'm running for mayor, because I'm going to make a difference on jobs. I'm proposing one of the most bold access to capital programs this city's ever seen. I'm going to make a difference on public education. We will put more money in the classroom in St. Paul. I'm going to make a difference on snow plowing, libraries, rec centers, the city services that you see each and every day. Folks, I've got 30 years of being involved in this city. I've got a record of getting things done. I am looking forward and excited to be your mayor of St. Paul, where we can really move this city forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Holbrook. 
Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to be here. I would uh, also like to acknowledge uh, my name is not Chers, and I've already accepted their apology for misspelling my name. But um, outside of that, my name is Chris Holbrook. I am a contrast to all the other candidates you've heard from. I am, uh, I'm not sure about these two, but uh, I am a fiscal conservative. I have one promise, and that is to work to reduce property taxes, which have gotten outrageously high. Uh, and I would challenge everyone at this panel to make a pledge to lower property tax in some, in some way, shape, or form. And I would propose ranked cho choice voting, if you're not too familiar with that, I would actually challenge for every percent on the top line of ranked choice that's allocated to me that the candidates pledge to reduce the gross uh, levy by a million dollars, which is currently at 139 million. But th to be brief to finish, uh, we do have problems, but we have solutions and we have benefits. Uh, we have mismanagement in this city of projects and expenses. We have overspending. Uh, we've created an environment hostile towards businesses, and we have incredible racial disparities. The solutions, I believe, are reducing property taxes, regulations, and fees. Uh, to spread out, uh, we're going to spread out the tax base. Uh, I think we also need to ban bans. I, I would like to suggest a moratorium on banning things. Um, the, uh, the other two solutions I propose are freezing or lowering minimum wage. I'm opposed to raising it to 15, and we, we, I'm sure we'll get into that later. And I would like to freeze and lower drug possession arrests. The benefits from all of these fixes, well, are a common sense results of balanced budgets, more money in your pocket to spend how you like. That creates more jobs, more higher wages, more affordability. You have more personal freedoms, individual rights uh, to live your life as you see fit. Thank you. Oh, here we go. Mr. Holden. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. Uh, the veterans and service people that we have, if they're here, to the League of Women Voters and uh, also to Jonathan. My name is Tim Holden. I ran against Chris Coleman back in 13. I have a background in small business. I've been a small business owner for 25 years. The capital city of St. Paul has a tremendous amount of problems, and I'm going to cut to the point real quick. We have over 40% of the people living in St. Paul in poverty, which is not acceptable. We need to create commerce, jobs, jobs, jobs. As a candidate running for mayor, I'm not asking for your money. I want your mind. Money doesn't solve problems, it creates problems. People, we need to work together, and that's not happening. The current administration we have in place has been there for 12 years. What's happened? Taxes have gone up and up and up. The most recent, 25%. Ah, it's unimaginable. I think whoever gets elected next is going to have all kinds of problems come their way that aren't on the table yet. So get ready. Um, We've created, the current administration has created a precedent for subsidizing development. Everything that happens in St. Paul is subsidized. Unacceptable. We need to create commerce, create competition. People need to work together, and that's not happening. We have people that have, and I'm going to go a little bit out of bounds on the campaign finance. I had a gentleman ask me a question, but I think we need to have campaign finance reform also. Again, people raising over a quarter of a million dollars in campaign dollars. Let's, let's talk about the priorities. Let's listen to what the people want. What do the people want? That's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Yeshua? Oh, Am I saying it right? Today, took a walk today. Whoa, everybody. Hi. I took a walk today on Lexington Boulevard, and uh, they're fixing the roads, which is a big thing uh, for taxes and stuff like that. Um, they're replacing the, some of the sidewalks, and they were brick walkways, and they had a couple of chips here and there, could have been fixed easily, and they're tearing up the whole thing and throwing the bricks in in the dumpster. I mean, good bricks, you can recycle those things. And that was thousands and thousands of dollars of waste. And then they put down bitumen tar, which 
gets water underneath it and creates potholes. And our friend, the city councilman, wasn't he had a little skit where he was fishing in a pothole <laughs> uh, last week or something? Anyway, um, that was one of the ways things that I discovered. And stucco houses, you know, you, you see them around, these old stucco houses, you never need to reside them. They last forever. Why can't we do that on the streets? Um, just a little insight there. Anyway, my name is Barnabas. I'm running for mayor because I'm very passionate about the city and the people. I was downtown at the, um, the shelter for men today, and I talked to some people who go around and talk to themselves and said, hi, how's it going? And they snapped out of it and said, hi, how you doing? And it's like, wow, this guy is normal underneath, even though they talk to themselves. So <laughs> people are people, and there's hurting people everywhere, and we need to j get out of our shell sometimes and say, what can I do to help? With that, I'm done. All right, we will transition to questions now. As you can see, I have many, many questions, so we will do our best in the next hour to get to as many of them as possible. Um, there were some previously submitted through organizations, um, and I'm going to try to consolidate those. So I will ask the first question, and we will go in alphabetical order, but I will change the first person in that alphabetical order with each question. So we'll start with Ms. Anderson, we'll go to Mr. Carter, Mr. Cruz, and, and so on, if that makes sense. Uh, the first question is that about racial disparity. So I would ask the candidates to talk specifically um, to the issue, well, broadly to the issue of racial disparity, but particularly to bringing um, high paying jobs to this community and other African American communities. So we'll start with Ms. Anderson. Racial disparity. I sent out a letter today to, uh, oh golly, to save the Super Bowl. Now that scenario has been triggered into racial disparity, which in my heart, I believe is triggering white genocide. We are in very serious times. So be very careful. I don't want to be your mayor. And I'll tell you why, and I said that last night. If we're going to have so much problems with the Super Bowl, we're going to have violence, we're going to have riots. Watch the video with uh, uh, Warnin and Kathy Warnin, and she's the assistant chief of police, which I believe the police and the city attorney should be elected by the people so they're accountable to you and stop this police brutality. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carter. You know, our city, we lead the nation in many ways in racial disparities. When I first ran for city council, I remember standing in this room and saying, I love Minnesota, I love St. Paul, we're an education state, we're a home ownership state, we're a job state, I love it so much, I want some of it in my neighborhood. Because across the board, in Minnesota, in so many of those areas where we plant our state flag, we also lead the nation in the disparities. And that creates a crisis. We talk a lot about the crisis that creates in our communities of color and on the east side, but that's creating a citywide crisis. That's a problem for our entire city because we just cannot continue to build a thriving space like that. Our plan has to be to focus on hiring communities of people in communities of color. It has to be able to focus on making sure that all of our children get a great education through initiatives like the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, which we built out of my city council office when I was on the city council. And it has to focus to taking our, 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 our diverse and our multilingualism, which we often, too often treat as a barrier and as a, as a problem for Minnesota. We want to close the gaps and we want to teach our kids English. We have to switch our lens and treat it as an asset, and that means uh, building the economic, the global economy that we have here and celebrating our multilingualism as an asset. Okay. Thank we you. need to move to Mr. Cruz. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I was the first candidate in this race to talk about bringing Amazon to St. Paul. So I think w the next mayor is gonna have to have vision and foresight. I was the first candidate in this race to talk since 2013 to advocate getting 70,000 families out of p poverty by raising the minimum wage to a cost of living wage of $15 an hour. The, po the, um, the racial disparities are caused by the policies that are created 
from City Hall and our government. So as mayor, I will start undoing the policies that created the disparities in the first place. And I think when we have more time, and we'll get into um, some of the solutions that I have for that, like reparations and raising the minimum wage to a cost of living wage of $15 an hour. Thanks. So specific things that I think we can do in addition to raising the minimum wage. Um, my solar on the schools proposal um, includes a 50% minority um, hiring requirement. I also believe that we should uh, be working on the program that Rebecca Knacker is working with, the Wilder Foundation, to make sure that every kid between the ages of two and four is in daycare in daycare that is specifically tied to the St. Paul curriculum so that we have more of a chance of keeping the kids in school um, and in the St. Paul school system. I also believe that we should expand the Right Track program. Um, last year they had 1,200 students, uh, primarily kids of color, um, trying to go for 500 jobs. So clearly there's a huge need and the Right Track program has been incredibly successful in terms of increasing kids' attendance at school, in increasing their grade average, and, in, and encouraging them to go on to college. So those are a few of the specifics. Thank you so much. So I'll, ref I'll refer back again to the example of Control Data, a company that came into a community and hired within the community. We have the capacity to do that. We have to incentivize businesses to come here. And if you look at the last 10 years of this administration, if the same amount of effort had gone into building stadiums and other entertainment venues as it had to try to bring small manufacturers here that are going to employ people in the community, we would have made significant progress already. It also includes education. We have to align the skills with the jobs that are available, which means in high school and college. There are 7,500 small manufacturers in Minnesota that will employ people that are not highly skilled, but they're not located here. And so people are leaving the community to try to find jobs. We need to bring the jobs into the community. And that's something we can do by actually finding out what companies need to do to we come here. We need to move. Sorry. I'm not done. Oh, I thought. Oh, my, my apologies. An uh, extra 10 seconds. And, and um, we, we need to bring companies here so the jobs are here and arrange transit so people can get to the jobs. The Midway would have been a great place to co-locate businesses and develop a technology hub um, instead of building a stadium, for example. Thank you. My apologies for the interruption. I'm trying very hard to keep these things straight here. No problem. Clearly, jobs and education uh, are, are critical aspects of, of how we are going to approach and solve the issue of racial disparities in St. Paul, specifically with, res with respect to jobs. I am proposing one of the most bold access to capital programs the city's ever seen. I am drawing on my 18 years of public finance background, and we are going to invest $100 million in an access to capital program in targeted neighborhoods of St. Paul that will provide up to 25 to even $50 million in individual neighborhoods so that we can do things like control data. We can do things like hiring jobs right here, uh, providing jobs right here in this, in this neighborhood. We're going to do that if I'm the mayor of this city because, um, and, and it will not require any use of the, of the property tax levy. This is just a shift in thinking of how we do our long-term investment portfolio, which will make a difference in this neighborhood and in targeted neighborhoods throughout the city. In addition to responsible tax policies and targeted investments, we're going to make a difference on jobs in many communities in St. Paul. I uh, brought up racial disparity in my opening comments because I, as a white person in St. Paul, I am ashamed of those st uh, statistics. A family of four in St. Paul who's white makes $81,000 a year medium income. A family of four who's black makes $33,000 a year in median income. Minimum wage laws keep poor people poor. They eliminate the opportunity for entry-level jobs and part-time workers. They disincent business investment. On top of that, I also brought up imprisonment, which is also disproportionate in this town and in this state. 15% of our population is black. 36% of those imprisoned are black. And the drug use is at the same rates between white people and black people. That is shameful. So those, fixing those two situations with investments that are equitable across the city, not just taking from 
the average in poor neighborhoods to help the downtown and stadium uh, districts. Uh, like Tom said, I would support that as well. Thank you. Disparities in St. Paul are unacceptable. Back in 2013 when I ran, um, there was a debate. I had one debate against Coleman and everyone should go and listen to the debate. Coleman got raked over his record. Curtis Gilbert wrote a story on it. At that time, the educational disparity was the worst in the nation. Unemployment was the worst in the nation. This was back in 2013. Things have not gotten any better. They've gotten worse. We need to take a direction where we're going to listen to the people. We need to ask the people what the priorities are, not mandate things. Professional sports, semi minor league baseball, over, over. We've got priorities that need to be dealt with. People need to be taken care of. Thank you. Mr. Tao, we'll give you a moment to get acclimated if you'd like. We can come back to you last okay. if that's helpful. <laughs> Mr. Yeshua. Oh, um. <coughs> well, I don't really have much to say on this, but when I was in high school in 1985, I took an African-American beautiful lady to prom, and uh, I've dated Spanish people. It's not the, out, the skin outside factor, whatever. A man looks at the outside, God looks at the heart. Everybody should be given the same opportunities no matter what. So just to bring up to speed, Mr. Tao, we're, the question is about racial um, disparities and speaking generally about what you might do broadly and specifically in the African American community around the issue of jobs. And it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. Um, you know, if you go to the St. Paul's website and they trout it all over the place that St. Paul is the most livable city in America, but the data shows us that that's not true. It's only most livable if you're a certain race, you make certain income, and you live in a certain neighborhood. I live in Frogtown. My wife and I, we choose to live in Frogtown because we want to be in the middle of the fight. Because we experience discrimination, we experience dis uh, disparity, we are part of the statistic. I'm running to change that statistic. And I know I can't do that alone, but the diversity of this room, the smartness, the, invest, the invested community that's in this room, if we work together, we can make sure kids have good paying job, ages 14 and up. We can make sure that kids at home, they have a place to rest their head and have a pillow over, and a roof over their head. It makes no sense that we live in America, the richest country in this world, but we have kids that are starving tonight. And that's why I'm running mayor. I want to change that system. I'm tired of all the people having all the resources, all the opportunity that money can buy, but regular folks like you and I, we struggle. I want to change that. I want to change it with you. OK, thank you. Um, the next question really um, gets at the issue of our partnership with public schools. I'm going to try to consolidate a couple of questions here. And this one will start with Mr. Carter. Um, the first part of this question is really about the opportunity gap between low-income and affluent students and how we would help them um, get better opportunities with pre-K, but also talk about um, school safety, if you might, and um, include the fact that enrollment in St. Paul Public Schools has dropped, and what would you do about that issue? It's quite a minute. I apologize. <laughs> schools, go. <laughs> So I've got a long history of working with our St. Paul Public Schools, and that's probably why I'm endorsed. My candidacy is endorsed by a majority of our St. Paul School Board and by our St. Paul Teachers Union. When I was on the city council, we worked together out of my city council office to build the St. Paul Promise neighborhood, an education-based initiative right in this neighborhood that has brought over $20 million of investment in St. Paul schools and children right in this community. And I spent the last four years working as 
as an education advisor to Governor Dayton, working on exactly what you just described, early childhood. So I've got an expertise in that area. Our plan starts with early, early education. That means we can help make sure that our children are, are, are saving for college and our families are saving for retirement. We can work through our parks and libraries to support child care environments to provide quality environments for their children. We can work with our community to make sure that we're creating sort of ramps to many different di different routes, not just the traditional four-way, four-year colleges, and we have to be champions and cheerleaders for our schools every chance we get. Thank you, it's Mr. Cruz. the best Cruz. I can do in a minute. I Thank know. You. It's a lot in a minute, but do your best, everyone. Mr. Cruz. Thank you. Um, again, um, St. Paul Public Schools, I love St. Paul Public Schools. I'm a product of St. Paul Public Schools. However, St. Paul Public Schools was not designed for the psychological development of people of color. St. Paul Public Schools was designed for the psychological development of white boys. We need a curriculum and a school system that is designed for the psychological development of every child in the city of St. Paul. And also, I don't think that we should go, I just worked at a charter school for about a year and I taught kids how to uh, grow food and sell it. And I don't, I think that just like with public transit, you have different. You can have public transit, or you can use Uber, or you 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 can use Lyft. And I think that we need to take that approach when it comes to education. Thanks. So I'm a former public school teacher, and I know how difficult it is to um, be in a classroom without the right kinds of supports. One of the things that I think is really important is the restorative justice programs that we've got in six schools and they're adding three more this year. What, the, what that does is working on what Trey Hearn was saying, it actually starts to promote a kind of emotional literacy for people from a very early age. It's based on indigenous practices. At the, at the younger levels, it's passing around a talking stick and saying, what made you happy? What made you sad? What made you angry? What can you do about it? At higher levels, it becomes leadership circles, where kids come together in a circle to deal with any kinds of challenges that they've got. And what it's resulted in at one of the schools is 239 fewer referrals. Those are referrals to the principal, referrals outside of the school, because kids have a sense of agency and that they can deal with their own problems, and it promotes a sense of community. That's what I'd like to see more of in our schools. So I'm the only one up here that's actually served on a school board. And for me, this issue has always been about building partnerships with our schools, which unfortunately the school district has not done enough with. They've primarily been ad hoc. We need something like the Hamlin to Hamlin Collaborative, where, which they collaborate with Hamlin Elementary. Every school in St. Paul needs a higher ed partner, but it needs to go beyond that to all the businesses, all the organizations. We need adults in our schools. We need pathways for kids to see what adults do so that they can see a pathway forward for themselves. But we need adults in the schools to be able to mentor and tutor, and I think that will help in part with the discipline problem. But we also have to focus on that it is a community-wide problem. It is not just, or it's a community-wide solution. It's not just when your kids are in school. Everyone in the city has to take responsibility for kids in our schools. And we can't just point fingers. We all have a role in this, so we all need to be part of the solution. And if we're all involved, to me, otherwise, 10 years from now, the literature for people running for school board will be the same thing, the opportunity gap and how we're going to close it. Either we know how to solve it or we don't. Let's move forward and take care of it. Thank you. Public education is our future. It, Laura and I are proud to have four children in the St. Paul Public Schools, fifth grade down to kindergarten at Expo Elementary in St. Paul. I have 18 years of school finance experience. I am proposing a specific and financial, direct financial relationship between the city of St. Paul and the school district that will put more money in the classroom. I'm proposing a joint energy efficiency project that will put millions of dollars in the St. Paul classroom. I'm also proposing that we put the St. Paul Public Library and St. Paul Public Librarians in targeted schools in St. Paul, bringing our library into the school system. I am also proposing that the city uh, start funding music programs in targeted schools in St. Paul so we can free up dollars to continue to provide money into the classroom. We have to invest in public education, folks. We've been talking about dollars and dollars and dollars for public education. We've got to put that money in the classroom. We have to bring this community together 
We can bring the business community into it. We can bring neighbors into this. We must put more money in the classroom. I have a specific plan to do that. I do not have a specific plan to fix education. Uh, I do not have any children. I do not follow the educational system very well. Uh, what I do follow is that it is uh, our public schools in St. Paul are $23 million in the hole. That the education rate is one of the lowest in the state. Out of a 143 ranked cities in Minnesota, St. Paul is 132nd as far as residents with a high school diploma. The number of minorities are 18% below that, the worst gap in the nation. I think investment is necessary. We can spend $275 million building high density housing, but for the first five years I lived between Frogtown and Midway and I went by Central High School, I swear I thought it was a prison. Why can't we spend money rebuilding that? We closed down Rondo Library all summer, which yeah. is only 10 years old, so I think there's a, a bit of disingenuous lip service to some of these uh, other solutions. Thank you. Thank you. Schools, um, St. Paul has a tremendous problem right now with safety in schools. Teachers are being assaulted. Kids are bringing guns, knives to school. It's unacceptable. Who do we need to blame? I think we all need to look in the mirror. Everybody everybody is responsible we need to work together on this issue kids having kids kids that are trying to survive on the street 2,000 kids in St. Paul are homeless homeless this is an issue that we need to address people forget the soccer stadiums forget the professional sports forget the garbage let's get our head out of our you-know-what and let's do something right for once thank you Thank you. Uh, you know, this is a complex issue, and, and this is a time where we need a leader, a mayor, who understand that the education gap is connected to our economic gap, right? And that if we want to help fix our school, then we need to have opportunity for African-American parents so they can have regular job, eight to, uh, to four, so they can spend that time with their kids. Uh, we need to create space where our kids and the teacher can feel safe to go and learn. We need to make sure that our teachers are reflective of the community that they're teaching so that young kids have role model, that they can believe that someday they could be like their teacher. We need to teach, we need to change our curriculum so that it's reflective of the community. When kids know their history, when they have pride, when they learn about the Rondo spirit and the Rondo community in their elementary school and it's taught every day, it's not just on African American, uh, Black History Month, kids will respond differently. They will have a sense of pride and that they belong, and that this country is there, and they're gonna work hard to make sure they can, they can contribute to this community. I'm proposing a strong initiative for all day pre-K. I'm proposing a initiative for African American business, and millennials and seniors, and I mean, uh, immigrants and women. We, we need to move to the next candidate. Sorry, I got excited. <laughs> Ooh, I just came back from a four hour public hearing, sorry. I'm a product of St. Paul Central. Everything that glitters is not gold. What you see is what you get. And if I call you baby girl, guess what TV program I like? Criminal Minds. I believe in homeschooling. I'm a self-taught senior from the School of Hard Knocks, having been married to two veterans from the Korean War. I'm a blogger. I've got over 100 blogs. I've got thousands of PDF files. I've got so much forensic evidence to bring all these people down. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't want to be your mayor because I'm really seriously concerned about the, I keep calling it the soccer stadium, <laughs> but the Super Bowl is not going to be a money maker. We're going to be in debt. Anyhow, as far as children, I believe the parents should have more control over their kids. Teach your kids morals and on and on. Thank you. Mr. Yeshra. Uh, complex issue. Um, I met a man at the fair called Greg Copeland, and um, I think I would back him for superintendent. 
Um, he has some good ideas, like um, all minds matter, an education plan for each child, no property tax increase, cut bloated administration costs. There's a couple of things I agree with, but um, I did some teaching uh, in private schools, little Bible schools, and it was from people from all over the inner city. And uh, I tell you what, if you can get five minutes after they all come down from the hustle and bustle and they all settle down and you can get five minutes of quality time and you put something in their mind, they will respect you and they will come back wanting more. But we have to have quality teachers who understand that kids are kids, you know, and they do frivolous things because they're kids. You know, you can't be smacking them every time they do something. I mean, we got people with ADD and uh, all kinds of learning disabilities. I met a lady um, in Frogtown, and she asked me to help with um, we need to move to the somebody next with a learning question, disability. Question, Mr. Yeshua. Thank you. Okay. Um, so at this time, I'm tr again trying to consolidate a couple of questions that seem to focus on public safety. So I'll ask the candidates to speak broadly to the issue of public safety, but to think specifically about how you would work with law enforcement to build communities that would have trust and stop police brutality, particularly in um, communities of color and within the GLBTQ community. How would you increase a sense of safety and connection between those communities and the police department? And we will start with Mr. Cruz. I apologize for the loaded questions, but this is what you're giving me, folks. <laughs> um, so I've been involved in the conversation locally and nationally about uh, police accountability. Uh, one of my platform is uh, the St. Paul Police Department is one of the most deadliest po police departments in the state of Minnesota. Uh, we're facing $20 million in lawsuits. So I, I want to bring forth um, legislation to require all St. Paul police officers to carry professional personal liability insurance so that the taxpayers are not on the hook for excessive lawsuits. For instance, when Mr. Frank Baker was bit, bitten by police, by a police dog and stumped and his lungs collapsed, our chief, Todd Axel, fired the officer, but he still got his job back. So I also want to renegotiate the contract with the city that we have with the St. Paul Police Department about the progressive discipline aspect of the, of, of, of the contract. And I also want to do more community policing, more have the police come to rec centers and visit with people without we their need, guns and uniforms. We need to move, thank you. Thanks. So I've been on a ride along and I've actually got another ride along scheduled for Friday night. And I've met with the, the chief of police and I've been to numerous meetings about Cordell Handy and uh, Philando Castile. And a number of things have, have struck me. Um, one is that less than two tenths of 1% of all police calls require force. So what we really need our police officers to do is to be relationship experts and to be psychologically savvy. So I really support more de-escalation techniques. And one of the places where I think we should do a deep dive is looking at the, prepar the preparation and the criminal justice programs that are, that are in the neighborhood. Um, St. Paul Police is paying for an entire class to go through Century College, which is 55% kids of color with the assumption after they go through the criminal justice program that they will come on the force. But if you look at the types of, of classes that they are going to be taking, they do not include the kinds of things that we are most asking for our police to do. And so one of the things I think we should do is make sure that those classes are there. I've already talked to the deputy chief of police about that. He thinks that's a great idea. And so those are things that I'm working on already. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I would refer you to my lit piece where I've put specifics in there about um, policing and how we improve it. I will just paraphrase. When Chris, when Chris Lawley was arrested in the Skyway and we had that incident, it was a perfect opportunity to bring the community together and talk about that issue. Nothing happened. When Frank Baker was, had, had his leg brutalized, another opportunity to bring people together to talk about what's going on. Nothing happened. Um, we need to rebuild trust. And the only way we're going to do that is if we have officers who are part of this community. Only 16% of the force lives in St. Paul. While we can't mandate that they live here, we can incentivize such through workforce housing 
or breaks on mortgage to get them to live here. That's the only way they're going to know the people who live in the community. We have to focus on de-escalation and more people of color being hired and all that. But I guarantee you, I would not have had a dog sicked on me the way that Frank Baker did, and I probably wouldn't have been subjected to the incident in the Skyway. And so we need to be real about that and what's missing in the relationship with the community over those kinds of behaviors. Thank, Thank you. you. St. Paul Police Department needs to be staffed, trained, and, and needs to reflect the diversity of this community, and they need to uh, enforce the law with dignity and respect in our community. They also need to be out in our community, okay? I spent uh, the better part of the summer uh, at Safe Summer Nights programs throughout the city in neighborhoods where police officers and young people were having hot dogs, having hamburgers, playing basketball, and they were interacting, the police department was interacting with our young people. I'll say it again, our police department truly needs to be out in our neighborhoods. They need to be in this neighborhood, they need to be in all neighborhoods, working with citizens. One of the great things about Safe Summer Nights is that the police department actually goes out and they door knock the community. They door knock the community and say, hey, you know, instead of talking about a criminal act or something else, they say, hey, we're gonna have hot dogs and hamburgers, let's do that. So we need to be staffed, they need to be funded for training, they need to reflect this community, and they need to be out in our community. Some of the ideas I have have already been uh, spoken to. Um, police liability insurance is a spectacular idea and I fully support that. De-escalation training is also severely required. Um, as I said in my opening statements, I would also push the chief to limit or freeze arrests for drug possession, which are inherently racist and discriminatory. If this city can waive federal standards on immigration, why can't it waive federal standards on drug enforcement? We arrest minorities at a rate of eight to one, and we imprison them at a rate double that of white people with the same usages. So uh, in addition, I, I oppose the St. Paul Police Department accepting military hardware from the federal government. I think that is an escalation problem that uh, they have created. Thank you. Um, I have a background in policing. I went to school at St. Cloud State, have a criminal justice degree. I actually went through the, Saint, the Skills Academy and worked with the St. Paul Police Department uh, force unit for a while. Um, police officers have a difficult job. Shootings are up 75% in the capital city, which is atrocious. 75% shootings are up. Public safety is number one, folks, I think is utmost important. The police need to be involved with communities. They need to be involved with the kids. If I become mayor, the police will be involved with the kids. If we have a police officer that's going to put a boot to somebody, sick a dog on them, I'll find a way to get rid of them. These unions, ridiculous. We're paying $2.5 million out. That police officer should be held accountable for that. Not all the people paying the taxes in the city of St. Paul. We need to look at what we're doing, hold the police accountable, and love one another. Thank you for the question. Um, as a council member uh, on the city council, um, I've already been doing some of those work. So for example, the, uh, to build trust and heal the community, I work on removing the two police officer off the civilian review board so that we can have it all civilian. Uh, the vote was six to one and I lost, but I didn't stop. I organized with the community, some of you are in this room, and we flipped that vote uh, to two to five, so we have that. Uh, I also worked on the body cam to make sure that we have body cam to create accountability and transparency. Um, I supported the police training facility because we needed a space where our police officer, their job is dangerous. It's a tough job. And, and some of the situation they go into, even psychiatrists can't help. So uh, we need to help them to give them the training they need to de-escalate, to work with the community, to treat our kids like their kids, to treat our grandparents and our aunts and uncle like their aunts and uncle. 
And if we start at the basic of respecting each other and not having those bias, we will get along much better. And we need to have our police officer be reflective of the community. And, it, and all of this uh, public safety also it are connected to people who have good paying job and are out we of need poverty. To move to the we next will have candidate. public safety. Thank, Thank you. you. as a victim of police brutality. My Rottweiler was poisoned. I've been thrown in jail. I've been beaten up. And I'm a white woman. 1983, my mom ran for mayor of this town because they were harassing me. Currently now, DSI, these license inspections, are becoming part of the police force. And this is unconstitutional. I say the next mayor, I like Todd Axtell. I think he's okay. Do you know the three highest paid employees is the deputy mayor making 156000 a year, the police chief, and the water board? I've got 30 seconds. Please research. Do your homework. Thank you. Mr. Yeshua. Okay, I don't know how I'm gonna get all this in. I went on a bike ride about a year ago, went to visit my father who's ailing in California, and I drove my bike 200 miles south. I had longer hair back then and a leather jacket. I got pulled over 50 times. Finally had a nervous breakdown and ended up in the psych ward. And uh, that was a l nice vacation, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, I've been sitting out here on Philando Castile's uh, bench over here. It's a nice little marble bench, thinking and pondering uh, things that went on there. And, you know, I, I think the person that shot him is still probably messed up from that. You never forget anything like that. They're, it's a tragedy on both sides. Um, but it happened. Uh, I just reported a robbery today. I was a block from the police station, and I got mugged. Knocked over the head, they stole my backpack. Fortunately, I had my fanny pack in the back and they didn't get that. But um, yeah, uh, I'm looking for answers. I went down to get some answers at the front desk and they need to put somebody in the front desk that's not a policeman because- We do need to move to the next candidate. They don't really seem to help you. Thank you. Hi, I shared with you earlier that I'm the son of a police officer, so I literally grew up inside the St. Paul Police Department. I tell folks all the time, uh, I, growing up, I knew a whole lot of police officers, and then I turned 16 and I started driving, and I met a whole lot more every day. <laughs> so I have an unmatched, I have an unmatched perspective on the culture of the St. Paul Police Department. And that's why when I was on the city council, I worked so hard on it. We fought hard to make sure that we weren't investing in tasers. We fought to invest that money in summer programs for youth instead. We fought to make sure to promote police accountability when we hosted the RNC here. Um, as a mayor, we have a four point plan essentially. It starts with hiring officers who reflect our city's diversity. It means leveraging technology to make it easier to file a complaint or feedback on our officers. It means partnering with mental health professionals, social workers, and crisis counselors to reduce use of force and connect people in crisis to help. And finally, it means re reforming our use of force policies to make sure we that we can hold officers accountable question. for their actions. Thank you. Thank you. So our next question um, largely revolves around bikeability and walkability of our city. Um, earlier this year, the city council passed a capital city bike plan. Please talk about how you would support that or what your philosophy on that would be and implementing it given that it wasn't funded. Um, well, that's what this question says. So I, um, and then also walkability in the city um, and safety crossing streets. So we'll start with Mr. Cruz. In um, August 1st, I was ran over by a, a Parks and Recs vehicle. So and the handlebars went into my stomach. It caused a hernia. They ran over my legs. So I'm so happy to be able to stand here before you and talk about this today. Um, the city of St. Paul has a pedestrian safety initiative, and I think that before we start with the public, we need to start with 
the employees and make sure that the employees understand the pedestrian safety initiative first. Also, I would uh, create PSAs and uh, other commercials to uh, run on local radio stations about uh, safety, pedestrian safety. And I would, uh, I do support, I think we need to have, the, I do support the bike plan for St. Paul. Ms. Dickinson, and I apologize, you should have started this round. Oh, okay. Trying to keep it fair. Well, as the Green Party candidate, I would be thrown out of the party if I didn't support, um, <laughs> if I didn't support bike plans. Um, yes, I absolutely do support the bike plan. I'm excited by the grand rounds, the idea that we can connect more and more of the city so more and more people um, are able to, uh, to commute and to enjoy biking. I also believe that we need to pay attention to small businesses when we do expand them and to make sure that we, um, that we, we provide uh, alternatives if their parking is taken away and that we work sensitively with them to make sure that um, they, can con they can continue uh, to be part of the neighborhood as well. Did I just see the stop? No. Oh, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, and in terms of safety and walkability, I was talking with um, uh, this lovely lady out in front about uh, Dale and how, how, um, how dangerous that she feels it is, and we were talking about traffic calming measures. And so I absolutely support traffic calming measures. There's studies out of Australia that suggest that the ones- We do need to move to the next candidate. Dang, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I support uh, having St. Paul being a bikeable, walkable city that people can be safe. But I, I feel the rancor that I've seen around some of the plans show that we have not done enough community engagement. When I ran for city council in Ward 4, I've, I didn't even know it was an issue. I knocked on enough doors of people that were really frustrated. Those who support biking were very involved, but the effort to bring in other peoples in the community seemed to be lacking. I don't think it's good public policy when we pass things over great objection. I think you need to find a way to build consensus and that we can't necessarily put bike lanes everywhere where we want to. Um, I'm also concerned that in the process, we decide to do something and for example, when construction costs were sky high, because of the stadiums and other projects being built around the city, we still push through a bike plan that cost us almost double. We have limited resources, we have to use them wisely, and we should not put bike lanes where people are not going to use them. So I support a bike lane, but we need to do it in a common sense, sensible way, and that's my policy, or that's my view. Thank you. I most certainly support the bike plan and complete streets programs that, that keep our city bikeable and walkable. St. Paul's a great city because you can bike around, you, you can walk. I know the public works budget extremely well. I know the money's in there. It's just a matter of prioritizing and deciding to fund the, the bike ability and the walkability of this community. I spent 12 years on that city council being a leader on pedestrian safety. We have to look at how we design streets how we design pedestrian ramps. You can't put a pedestrian ramp on a street that, that sends a wheelchair or a stroller or someone a walker right into the middle of the street. We have to design streets in a way that are, that are friendly to pedestrians of people with disabilities, seniors, strollers, you name it. I, I, I authored and passed the nation's only ordinance that allows citizens to petition the city council for increased crosswalk times. A walkable city is a livable city, a bikeable city is a livable city. I know where the dollars are, I know how to prioritize it. We will get that done in St. Paul. <laughs> this is a tough question for me because I don't have a bike. I really don't care about bike paths. Uh, I don't even know why we have them because we don't maintain any of the paths we have. Our money goes to stadiums and theaters and things for rich people. So uh, I'd like to see if there's all this money, if we can use some of it to repair what we have. In my neighborhood, they eliminated a row of parking to put in a bike path. The bikes don't even drive in that lane. They drive anywhere they want in the road. So I don't even know why we're wasting time painting the lines. That's my opinion. Bikes and walking. Um, I own some commercial property on University Avenue. And when they did the light rail, you would have thought they would have put in place, uh, this is kind of diverging off of bikes and walking, but it's parking for handicap. 
There's zero handicap parking up and down University Avenue where I'm at for at least three blocks. These are things that I think are a little bit more important. Um, walking is extremely important. We do have an issue though. You drive down Snelling Avenue. People now think they can just jump off the curb wherever they want to. And it's unacceptable. I think there needs to be more clarity with the laws that we have in place about crossing. Stopping for people. I was driving north on Snelling Avenue. The gentleman to my right, I was in the fast the passing lane, the gentleman to my right decided to stop for someone who was going to cross. I did not see the person. Thank gosh I was focused. Otherwise this person would have been dead. We need to have clarity on some of the simple things. Bikes and walking are important, but I think we've got a lot of other issues, and I, I, I'm all for bikes and walking. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I, I support the bike plan because I, I bike myself, and uh, I look funny on a bike because I can't reach the paddle very well. Um, no, it's true. Uh, but I think this is an equity issue. And I think that this, the street and the road, the sidewalk, belong to all the, all the citizens that lives in this city. And they're just as important. And when we have a uh, bike plan and we, we stripe the road, we protect them. And everybody in this city deserves uh, protection. Now, I'm also a champion of pedestrian safety because in January 2015, one of my grandmas was struck on uh, Whiteberry Avenue. She left all of us behind her, grandkids and everybody. So we need better enforcement. We need better education. Uh, we need to better plow our street in the winter so that people can bike all year round. And I'm an active participant of the Stop For Me campaign. There's money there to do this work. We have to make the decision that everybody's life's important and they want to protect everybody. Thank you. Hey, you silver foxes out there. <laughs> you want to know my bucket list? I want to get my Harley. And I want to belly dance before I kick the bucket. <laughs> so I used to ride a bike all the time. Remember Ruby Hunt? She rode her bike. They even had pictures of me running for something. I run for every office. And if I live long enough, I'm going to run for attorney general again to put Lori Swanson and stuff like that. OK, I don't walk anymore after dark. In fact, it's shocking that I'm even here. If I have to leave in a few minutes, because I have to now depend upon Metro Mobility to drive me back and forth because the city stole my car out of my yard with disabled plates on it. They shut my water off. Do you understand? I even sued Harris in 2007 to resolve this stuff. I got a half a million dollar judgment against the city because they won't answer. At least this time, Harris has become accountable. He does answer my rogue emails or for whatever. So, no, it, <laughs> I believe in walking, but it's too dangerous right we now. We do need to move to the next candidate. Thank you. If I leave, I'm not being rude. Mr. Yeshua. Well, this is something I am very, very, very passionate about because I rode my bike here. And uh, I ride my bike everywhere. and I. Like I said, I tried to ride my bike all the way to California, but I got a little nervous breakdown there. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, th don't ride on university because you will be run over. <laughs> and there's a simple solution with the walking signs, I mean, the sidewalks, because I yell at people that try to run me over. Um, I get really irate at that. Um, there's a little thing called a yellow uh, stand thing that's they put them up in the middle of uh, crosswalks and stuff like that in other cities it's probably cost you know hundred dollars for each one it really helps it makes people focus besides you guys all signed things on your license that you would look for pedestrians but people are so busy nowadays that they uh, don't see where they're going we need to move to the next candidate but, Bike lanes are one of many topics in which we end up getting stuck between trying to decide if our goal is to preserve the status quo of the St. Paul that we're used to or if we're here to build the city of the future that our children deserve. 
when I hear people talk about bikes versus cars, it makes me realize that we don't, we're not thinking yet about the fact that there's people on bikes and there's people in cars and we need to be designing our, our, our streets for all of us the people on bikes, the people on cars, the people on transit, and the people on foot. When I hear people say we don't have enough process yet to decide whether we should have bike lanes yet, that strikes me as a little silly. For me, I absolutely support our St. Paul bike, bike plan. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's disappointing that we haven't funded it. We need dedicated funding for our St. Paul bike plan. And we need to see that not as an expense, but as an investment, because people are looking, the people who are looking for, for places to plant their families and places to plant their businesses are looking for places where you don't have to have a car. That makes it actually less expensive to live in our community. Thank you. So we need to close this question, and we do just have a few minutes remaining. But there was another question that got quite a few, so I'm going to ask people to limit their, their comments, but to give some feedback on the minimum and increasing it to $15. Take 30 seconds to talk about the $15 minimum wage and 30 seconds to close. That seemed fair? A minute. So they're back to a minute. Sorry, guys. I know it's warm, but this is important. Go. Well, as I started out by saying, I'm a big supporter of raising the minimum wage to 15 now. Um, I just, it, it is so simple to me in certain ways that if you have something that would raise 68,000 people out of poverty, why would you not do it? Of course, we need to put in some protections for small business. I believe some of that is accounted by um, the slower phase in for smaller business. But this is something that I think we need to move from deciding whether or not we do it to thinking about how we do it. In, in conclusion, I would say that I stand for transparent, responsive, innovative, accessible, and diverse government. What that means to me is working more closely with the city councils and community councils so that everyone's voice is heard. I'm running for mayor not because this is a stepping stone to some higher office or some other office. This is it for me. I would like you to feel that you could come up to me in the street and tell me what's in your heart and mind. And I am not running to be the mayor. I am running to be your mayor. And I am unbought and unbossed. Thank you. So I applaud the 15 Now campaign and, and support the effort, the pathway to get everyone to $15 an hour. I do think the target needs to be the large corporations and Fortune 500 companies that have the money and choose not to share with their employees and often offshore the profits. So it's encouraging to see that Target has set the tone for raising wages by 2020 and I hope all of the other corporations will follow suit. Um, as far as the closing statement, I first want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, I am running on a campaign to change the status quo. We have a choice, soccer fields, soccer stadiums, luxury apartments or affordable housing, broadband for everyone or broadband from Comcast and CenturyLink, job creation or building stadiums and, and entertainment complexes that don't in the long uh, add to our tax base or create long-term jobs. So I've outlined what I call my blueprint for a better St. Paul. I've been running an issues-based campaign. I hope you will take a look at my literature and you will consider me as your first choice because I'm someone that is not beholden to special interests, someone who is going to change the status quo at St. Paul and actually provide opportunities for everyone to participate rather than just lip service about that. And thank you all for being here tonight. I absolutely support $15 an hour minimum wage. As a Metropolitan Airports commission, I, uh, Commissioner, I spearheaded the state's first increase to the minimum wage. It's imperative that we figure out ways to protect small businesses on the back end through license fees, through sales tax issues and property taxes so that we don't cause artificial inflation or, or force job loss. But I definitely support a $15 an hour minimum wage. I do want to thank everybody for being here. Thanks the league again and Hallie Q again for this really, really great night. I've talked about my background, I've talked about my experience. What I'm about is a specific plan to make a difference. I am gonna make a difference, we are gonna make a difference on jobs in this city with a specific plan on providing jobs in this city. We're gonna make a difference by providing more money into the public education, more money into the classroom. We're gonna talk about affordable housing, we're gonna make a difference on affordable housing so that the city is affordable for all. We're gonna manage our property taxes in this city, my mom and dad, died on Social Security. I watched my mom and dad move out of their house because they couldn't afford property taxes anymore. That's not gonna happen anymore. 
this city is going to represent all. I look forward to being your next mayor. Thank you so much again for being here. Again, I am your outlier that opposes uh, a mandated minimum wage. Uh, if you look at the experience in Seattle, there was a study done by economists at the University of Washington that showed it actually hurt low-income workers. It cost them, on average, $125 a month of their take-home pay <clears throat> because employers uh, can't afford increased costs. They cut payrolls. They reduced hours. They eliminated entry-level jobs. <clears throat> I think all employment should be a voluntary contract. I love $15 hour minimum wage. There are jobs such as Target. I applaud them for doing that. It should not be a mandated cost that will drive businesses out of St. Paul. <coughs> In conclusion, as you can tell, I'm uh, a libertarian. I'm fiscally conservative. I'm socially liberal. Uh, it makes me unique in this crowd up here. But uh, my goal, as I said, is to work to lower your property tax. If there's an issue that I'm unfamiliar with because I have a day job, I work 50 to 60 hours a week to make money, uh, I would love the chance to be hard work, I'd be a hard working mayor to roll up my sleeves, get into these issues and figure the cost benefit analysis if it's uh, uh, helping or hurting us. I will audit every department and I'll pass the mic now because my time's up, thank you. Thank you. Back in 2013, I supported $15 an hour. I still do. For small mom and pop shops, it's not fiscally responsible. It's not going to be possible. The cash flow is not there. We need to be realistic. Um, for certain sized organizations, yes, it's a good thing. I'd love to see it happen. We need to create jobs, period. We need to create commerce. The capital city has a 40 plus percent poverty problem. How do we fix that? Jobs, right? Jobs. We need to create jobs. $15 an hour on up. Um, the capital city has a lot of issues. I'm running because I want to give you a voice. I'm not going to dictate to you what needs to happen. I'm here to listen to you as to what you believe are the priorities. That's what we need. Somebody that will listen. This is not a person that can solve all the problems. We have so many problems in the 12 departments that it's going to take probably a good team of people to d fix the problems. The people need a voice, that's why I'm running for your mayor, to give you a voice. Thank you. Yes, I support $15 an hour and I'm, I'm so glad that some of you are here with me standing at the picket line and those, those, those uh, employee that were in threat of getting fired, and I'm happy that I was able to call their boss and uh, talk them into uh, keeping them, them on staff. Look, uh, my family and I, we came here as political refugee when I was eight years old, so I've seen what a bad government can do. I grew up poor with my mom, a single parent home in the public housing. I know what it's like to not have food on the table. And I want to thank you all in this room and out of this room have been so kind to the Hmong American community. You have given us so much and now we're contributing back. So I want to thank you for that. I want to thank our African American brothers and sisters, your ancestor, your, your courageous and your sacrifice and your leadership that has allowed the Hmong people to have the right to vote and to participate in this process. So I want to thank you for that. I've always been a short guy in my life. I've always had to work harder than everyone else. I've always had to uh, fight for the little people, the regular people. Tonight, it's about value. It's about who's gonna work for you, who has a history of working hard, who won't quit at noon, and who will make sure that you'll get your fair share of the resources and investment in the city of St. Paul. And I think that's uh, Dai Tao. And I'd love to have your first choice. If not, we need please give me your second candidate. choice. Thank you. Choice. This is a copy of the ballot, okay? It's really difficult, but right there I've blocked in my name. I'm trying to teach you people how to vote electronically. Vote in PDF files. I never thought of myself as a teacher, but right now I'm a senior advocate. What? Who said you to my Oh, close. Dale Tao just said to me, he says, you're not mad at me anymore. And I said, no, I'm not mad at you. <laughs> but we do have to cooperate with the United States president. He is our president, whether you like it or not. And if we do not have no federal bowling, funds coming into our state, 
You don't bite the hand that feeds you. Bite it. No, no, please. You don't bite it. <laughs> no. This is what starts kind of, um, anyhow, I'm a rebel, I'm a rogue, I'm a freedom fighter, former waitress at the Lexington Criterion, the Hilton Hotel. We do need to move to the next candidate, okay. thank you. I'm sorry I have to vacate the premises because I hope my driver's here. He's out there. Is he out there? <laughs> Mr. Yeshua, $15 minimum and closing statements, please. Um, I don't really know specifically how to vote on this, but I have a feeling that the 15 hour minimum wage, if it's mandated for everybody, it's actually gonna backfire and cause inflation on everything. Rent is at 3% vacancy rate right now, which I don't know what gives them the analogy that they can raise rent through the roof um, to where nobody can afford it. I mean, I can't afford to live in St. Paul. Um, but I'm stubborn, so I'll stick around. Um, I just think the consequences will be uh, disastrous if they raise the minimum wage, fiscally. Thank you so much for everybody for coming out today. I'm running for mayor in this city I grew up in, in this city our family's been in for 100 years. Uh, as someone who has sat in our schools and our rec centers as a student and as a child, as someone who has lived on a block that's been devastated by foreclosures, as someone who knows what it feels like to be pulled over for driving while black, and as someone who knows what it feels like to work for minimum wage, I strongly support raising the minimum wage. We do not want to be the type of place where people who work full time are stuck living in poverty. We talk a lot about having a city that works well for all of us, not just the ones who our city has traditionally worked for. That starts with making sure that more of us have a voice. I'm running to make sure that we all have a voice in City Hall. We all have a place in the future that we're building as a city. That means making sure that our city isn't just about building stuff, it's about serving people. When we build, when we build a billion dollar train and have to work five years just to get it to stop in our most transit dependent neighborhoods, we know we're focused more on stuff than on people. That has to change. I'm focused on changing that. I'm Melvin Carter. I'm asking for your first choice in November. And if I can't be your first choice, I'd sure love to be your second choice. Thank you very much. We'll close with Mr. Cruz. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank um, the NAACP and the Women Lo League of Women Voters for having this uh, and Holly Q. Brown for having us here today. Um, I want to, I've been fighting to raise the minimum wage to a cost of living wage of $15 an hour since late 2013 when I started running as the campaign manager for Lena Denise Bugg's campaign. Um, in 2015, I ran on against my brother Dai Tao to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. And today I'm standing here to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour too. Inflation is not, caught, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour will not cause inflation, but uh, raising our property taxes will cause the rent to go up. So also we have the, the biggest problem facing St. Paul right now and the east side is an example is disparities. So as our, as, the, as our community starts to change the complexion of our community, we need to start making sure that we're pulling people out of poverty, especially the 70,000 people who are living in poverty. And I have a plan, um, it's called the Migration Act, it's an act uh, we picked tobacco, we picked sugar, we picked cotton, so I want to uh, create a municipal bank. We need to close, Mr. Cruz. Okay, thanks. So thank you all for coming out from the League of Women Voters in St. Paul, the Hella Q. Brown Center, who graciously hosted us, the African American Leadership Council, and the St. Paul chapter of the NAACP. Uh, we hope that you have a good night, and uh, rock the vote.